I'm pretty happy that with every person who's gotten up here, it's become harder and harder to follow. So <laughs> thanks, guys. We came to play. Yes, you did. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam. I am a staff attorney at the National Center for Lesbian Rights and coordinator of the Born Perfect campaign. My name is also Sam, hashtag the Sams, um, and I am the co-chair of the Born Perfect Advisory Committee. I am a survivor of conversion therapy. I am not. Talking about this stuff really triggers me. Talking about this stuff is almost literally all I do. But together, we've built a partnership that allows both those things to be assets. We want to tell you a little about the issue we work on, but just as importantly, we want to tell you about the way we work on it. About a year and a half ago, we launched the Born Perfect campaign to end conversion therapy on LGBTQ people in five years through legislation, litigation, public education, and administrative advocacy. Conversion therapy is a set of dangerous and discredited practices that falsely claim to be able to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. When I was a kid, I was subjected to a combination of talk therapy and horrifying physical aversive conditioning techniques by a doctor who told my parents that he could turn me straight. And for years, Sam advocated against conversion therapy along with just a really small handful of other survivors. But we know that LGBTQ people are already more susceptible to health disparities, depression, substance abuse, suicide, as we know all too well. And when you add severe childhood trauma to that mix, it can get really deadly. Even the act of telling my story can be re-traumatizing, and so I'm not really gonna talk about that today. But I do wanna tell you about what we've been able to accomplish, excuse me, accomplish with this campaign, culminating in an incredible experience with the US Human Rights Network, which they actually made possible earlier this year. Sam and I were part of the US delegation to the United Nations Committee Against Torture meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. Speaking to the... Thank you. Um, it came up on Facebook a few days ago, reminding me that a year ago, I was the very first conversion therapy survivor to ever testify to the United Nations. That makes, thank you, thank you. That was an astounding experience, and if you've ever watched that video, you see I barely survived telling that experience. Um, it was horrifying and yet the most empowering moment because finally the world stage was mine and my heels alone. As difficult as that kind of storytelling can be, it can also be really effective. That's the difficult thing. Um, that day we got to make a bunch of torture experts cry. I love bragging about that. <laughs> Later that week, the committee went on to bring up conversion therapy for the first time in United Nations history. And just a few months after that, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights issued a report recommending that every member state across the globe take steps to ban conversion therapy. We were, we were surrounded all week by some of the most incredible advocates we'd ever met, many of whom are in this room today. Hey, guys. Uh, <laughs> they were working on everything from freeing, prisoners, from freeing prisoners from Guantanamo Bay to getting justice for the victims of racially targeted police violence. Out of over 70 people in the delegation, we were two, we were two of only three there, though, to talk about LGBTQ issues. The moment the committee first said the words conversion therapy, I think the whole room went into shock. To say we won much bigger than we were expecting is an understatement. But there's a reason we did, and I'm allowed to say it. The reason is Sam. It's completely Sam. If you get the chance, go to the Born Perfect website um, and watch their testimony. It's going to be the most powerful thing you see all day. Although next to these folks, we're, we're going to have yeah. some <laughs> really stiff competition. <laughs> Maybe, maybe check it tomorrow. <laughs> but it wouldn't have been possible if we just rattled off the research that I love so much and then put Sam in front of a mic to illustrate the point. From the very beginning of this, we knew it had to be a different kind of campaign, one that made the survivors the agents of change. And rather than using them in a strategy we devised from the top down, has the folks like me who can do this day in and day out without being triggered execute the plays they are calling? That's why I'm not the only one up here talking today, and I am sorry about the chair fiasco, U.S. Human Rights Network. <laughs> it wasn't always like this. I didn't always have someone sitting in a chair next to me. 
When we started this work a few years ago, I had many people telling me the 1980s called, they want their issue back. And I kept saying, I'm sorry, but I didn't go through this in the 1980s. I went through this a couple years ago. This is happening every day and survivors felt like we were alone because every single time we tried to talk about it, we went through extreme re-traumatization. And there was no one there to hold our hands to say, it's gonna be okay, we're gonna work on this again tomorrow. That was why it was very nerve-wracking when a big, well, big, LGBT organization stepped in and said, I want to help you on this issue. As survivors, we had lost so many of each other to suicide that we didn't trust anyone to come in and help us. And so I had to have a lot of really difficult conversations with Sam about how exactly our voices had to be empowered and not used. How we had to be celebrated and not punished if we didn't speak the exact words that we were supposed to be speaking, because it was our words to be spoken. So because of everything that Sam just told you when we started this, we knew that there was a really good reason for these survivors to mistrust national organizations, even little scrappy ones like in CLR. We're still a bunch of lawyers. I'm a lawyer. I'm sorry about that. God bless lawyers. <laughs> A lot of them had been through the type of conversion therapy that is, you know, making national headlines right now, but a lot of them had been through types that the state legislation we started with couldn't get at. Um, some came from families who couldn't afford talk-based therapy, a lot had families who had turned to churches for counsel instead, and others had been kidnapped in the middle of the night and sent out of the country to these unregulated boot camps where a lot of their friends didn't come back from. Forgive me for saying it, but this wasn't marriage equality. This is a matter of life and death. Um, so we turned to the research, and what it told us is that not only doesn't advocacy have to be re-traumatizing, it can actually facilitate resilience through three things. Narrative construction, community support, and leadership development. And I'm not gonna go super deep into this because Sam's gonna yell at me for being too nerdy, but if you want citations, please talk to me after. So starting with narrative construction, any good communications director will tell you that victim narratives work, they do. But those narratives are also linked with lower rates of trauma resiliency. Narratives of survival do the opposite. They actually have the power to decrease post-traumatic stress symptoms and increase post-traumatic growth. Um, the core of this campaign is storytelling, but storytelling with a purpose that pairs that incredibly effective advocacy with something that frankly is more important, which is healing. Next, we get community support. I can't tell you how many times I get asked by reporters how much I must hate the people who do this to kids. But the truth is that drawing the line in that sand can actually endanger survivors, many of whom are frankly included in that description. They are the people doing this. Families that can be persuaded intentionally engage in accepting behaviors put their kids at dramatically lower risks for depression, substance abuse, and suicide. Accepting faith communities do the same. Um, and not only have I seen survivors become ministers, I have seen the same families who put them through conversion therapy stand behind them while they testify against it. And finally, leadership, which, which is probably the most important one. Every person in this room, I think, probably knows that secondary trauma is the norm in this work and primary trauma is a close second. But research also tells us that survivors can make the most effective leaders. Not that we needed research to tell us that especially if they're being supported throughout the process rather than reenacting the trauma cycle to the point of burnout. And the way you support is through actual allyship, through partnership and collaboration, not through trotting them out. Sam and the survivors they mentor display exactly the kind of quality we want in the next generation of this movement's leadership. And what's more, there's even some data suggesting that this kind of work could be essential for full trauma resiliency. So I'm going to stop with the, with the data and the facts now. I've nerded out sufficiently. But I do want to say that um, it's worked, right? It's worked. We're making huge progress. We've passed laws in five states. We've been at the White House, the Surgeon General, the United Nations just in the last year alone. We've made incredible progress. Um, but the more important thing is how this partnership has changed things. It's changed things because it gave myself and my other fellow survivors the chance to learn how to take the skills that we're doing in this work and also apply it in our other forms of activism. I now know I can trust an organization if I can build the relationship with them knowing that I'm not going to be used. Right. That is how we build a movement. I'm, I'm a nuclear physicist. I do this every single day where instead of awesome LGBT gay for pay conversion therapy work, I 
advise Congress on ending nuclear waste. That's my work. But I can do that and trot through the walls of Congress in heels because I know that I have amazing allies who are gonna work with me on the different pieces. That's how we do movements is because we don't trot, our, trot us out and I don't have to worry about sitting in front of the United Nations alone. I know that I have people beside me who recognize that what I'm going through is going to be tough. The best way that I can give an example of this is that what we just did, I didn't have to tell you my story. Sam knows that I could have told you my story and we could have had a lot more of you on fire for the amazing people that are on this, on this stage. But I didn't need to because I didn't want to today. And that is the power of survivor-based advocacy, is you let us tell it when we want to tell it. <laughs> I don't even know how to follow that, except to say that as much progress as we've made, the truth is that the latest research we have shows that many as one in three LGBTQ people is still sent outside the home as adolescents to be changed. We're gonna end this, and we're gonna end it through some state laws, we're gonna end it through some federal laws, through some court cases, we're gonna argue our butts off, but really we're gonna end this through education, and the central component in that is empowerment of people like Sam, who can call the plays and I will execute whatever they call. Let's go get them. Yeah.